Good morning. We gather together to worship God, and we trust that you will experience God's presence together this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, our announcements and uh, everything that is basically going on right now is listed in um, the, the bulletin this morning, as well as the e-news. And um, just wanted to highlight again, we have been passing out these pink cards. And if you could just fill in your information um, if you filled in all of the information last week and nothing has changed, that's fine. But we would like to know that you are here, that we are doing this instead of sending those registration pads up and down the aisle. Um, and it also has a space on the back if you've got um, a specific prayer request as well as um, if you'd like more information. And if there is something on here that you would like more the information on that is not listed here, please let us know so we can make sure we get that to you. Um, so again, it is truly a joy and uh, an honor to be here this morning in worship. And if you are worshiping on Zoom, um, welcome. And um, and thanks. And Donna Beer is back today, so yay! Yeah, it's, it's like yay. <laughs> and I know she's had a wonderful trip because I've already heard parts of it. So it's like so exciting. And so God continues to new do a new thing in our midst and we continue to rejoice and celebrate. Let's worship. Our centering words. Do not fear your doubts, Mother Teresa, John of the Cross, and other spiritual giants who were tormented by doubts during their lives. Doubt is a pathway to a deeper, richer faith, a faith where we can say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Let us pray. Life-giving, Life firm in God. God. We come this morning remembering, remembering the, joy the joy of Easter, of Easter while facing the realities of this, of this world. world. Fill us with the hope of a new life that resurrection, that resurrection brings. brings. Help, Help us open, open our hearts to the never ending, unconditional love of this, of this Easter, Easter season. season. Be with, Be with us now in our time of worship, of worship and remain and with us each and every day as we, as walk, we walk our paths of life, and life of in faith. faith. Amen. <clears throat> our, <clears throat> our scripture is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. It was still the first day of the week. The evening, while the disciples were, were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive, then they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples said to him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left in the, by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the door was locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hands into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous things, miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in the scroll. But these things are written so that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's what? Now what? I mean, last week we did the big Easter thing, right? Did y'all have a good Easter, by the way? Yeah? 
Pardon me? It was only last week, I know, yeah. <laughs> but the, the question is now what? It's eight months, count them eight, till Christmas. So yeah, it was up in church, you know? Okay, so let me remind us that perhaps it's not the season after Easter, but it's the season of Easter. So for months, we're going to celebrate the effects, if you will, of Easter to keep in mind that uh, the resurrection is alive in us. And it's alive in us by all the good things that we do, good things that we say, how we behave in Jesus's name. Does that make sense? So there's no big, huge celebration other than to celebrate the great life and love. Hi, Henry. That's in us from Jesus. Yeah, there is mama. Yeah, mama, you're welcome. But Henry's doing great. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay. Um, so the gospel this morning. To me, there's two big events that happen in our gospel. The first one is uh, Jesus breathed on the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit. So he breathed the breath of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit a lot more when we get uh, close to Pentecost. I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, but for now, this passage about receiving the Holy Spirit means that Jesus was sending his 12 followers out to be disciples into the whole rest of the world. Okay, the 12 nations that existed at that time. Um, he was sending them out on a mission. Yeah, they were our first missionaries, if you will. Um, to make one church, one Christian church. And that was to bring belief and salvation to all humankind. So that's what that's about. Now, the second part is the famous story of the doubting Thomas. Anybody ever? You are adorable. Who are you, by the way? Who's this, Kate? Quinn? Hi, Quinn. Nice to have you up here with us. Uh, I'm Stacy, by the way. Uh, okay, so back to doubting Thomas. Okay. Um, in the passage, in the story, Thomas is not convinced that the guy standing before him is the risen Christ, is his teacher, Jesus Christ, right? Well, Jesus, right? He's just Jesus to him. Um, so he wanted proof. He wanted to see for himself, actually physically see that this was Jesus. So he said, show me your hands, right, Quinn? Show me your hands, right? And show me the, your side where the spear pierced him. So he wanted to see the holes in his hand from the cross, right? So um, he didn't believe until he could see it. So Jesus showed him his hands and his side and Thomas got to touch them and feel that that was true. He got proof that that was Jesus. Only when he got the proof did he say, my Lord, my God. Okay, now, Jesus asks us this huge question that we're going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. Do you believe only because you saw proof? Or are you blessed or happy because you don't see, but you believe anyway? Okay, so, all right, let's, let's tackle that one for a sec. Um, do we always have to see to believe? Is there anything you can think of that you believe in, but you can't see. Now, for example, uh, here's one for proof. If I said I can do a cartwheel with an amazing flip at the end, you'd probably want to see proof of that before you believed it. I can understand that. But is there anything you can think of that you don't need proof of, but you still believe in it? Brain is going miles a minute. Okay, let me help you out. How about electricity? You can see it, the, you can see that go between, the, 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 right? Yeah, the, yeah, a line. Good point. Okay, how about sound waves? How about Wi-Fi? We can't see it, but we know it's there, right? Okay, and we don't necessarily need proof to see it. We just believe in it because our phones work and our computers work, right? Okay, so, <clears throat> um, oh, okay, so I have an example. Oh. Imagine you're surprised that I have an example. Okay, here we got this pot. It's filled with three. Yeah, you can hold it, sweetheart. Thank you very much. That helps. Yeah, for, <laughs> way to go. What was Friday, Penelope? 
Earth Day. Very good, sweetheart. And that's exactly why I chose to do this lesson on plants and dirt and pots. All right? Okay. So anyway, it's filled up with dirt. And let's see, Krista, maybe you can help me out here. If I make a little hole. Okay. Can you put some seeds in for me? Yeah, sure. Why not? And cover it up. Excellent job. Very good. Now your hands, you want to wipe them on my pants? I don't care about my pants. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So we can't see the seed, but we know it's there because Cressida just put it in. All right. So now let's imagine that you guys are the pot. All right. That's your physicalness of you. You're the pot. And the dirt is God's love. You with me so far? Yeah, Quinn? Okay. The dirt is God's love, and you're surrounded by it. Now, the, spe the seed is what we call your spiritual life, right? And your spiritual life is not doing anything if you're not growing, right? So it's just the seed's just sitting in there being spiritual life, but it's not doing anything. However, if we have water, which you can see, if we add water to it, we can see the water going in to make it grow, right? It goes like that. That's right, Quinn. Yeah. And we can see the water going in. And just like we can see good deeds and the reaction of when we say good things to people. Now, the, um, there's one thing that the plant needs or the seed needs in order to grow that we can't see. And that's sunlight and so, oxygen. oxygen. Gosh, you're so, that's science class. You guys rock. Photosynthesis. Okay. Right. So the air is your faith, and we can't grow our faith without air, okay? And our seed. All right, your spiritual life. So um, if you have the seed of spiritual life in God's love and the water of good deeds and feel, well, you know what? Come to think of it, we do know there's air because... We can see it in the sense that the leaves blow and waves go. So we know it's there, right? All right. So <clears throat> we have our pot. We have you. We have the seed of your spiritual life. We have God's love surrounding you. All right. We have water, good deeds. And we have the air, the oxygen, which is your faith. All right. And when we have all those things, there you go, Quinn. What do you think? We have you that's blossomed and flowered in your faith. Okay? And I won't make you hold it so you don't get dirty. Okay, good. Okay. Oh, Kate, you want to hold it? Excellent. You know, you can have it, by the way. You want it? Okay, you can have it. That's your faith. Okay. So, bottom line. Jesus is telling us that we can live a happy life, blessed life, whichever you prefer, if we can't actually see God but we still believe in him anyway, all right? So to believe without seeing is to have faith and to know it only in your heart and soul that God exists and he lives with us. That was a long one and you guys were very patient. Thank you, Henry. All right, let us pray together. Lord, we know that we are often doubting Thomas, but we too are able to experience peace. Just as you were with Thomas, you are with us. We pray that you, that when we have that sinking feeling of doubt, you give us wisdom to turn to you. Believe that you are listening to our prayers and of your everlasting love for us. On this Sunday after Easter, help us grow into faith we celebrated last week. Help us to see with our hearts and souls. Help us to make our faith strong so we can see for ourselves the joy of following you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm sure that this is one of the songs that we've all sung since we were small children. But let's sing it together. Oh. 
saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. Holy, <coughs> holy, the darkness hides thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise O oh, holy God, our hearts come before you on this morning, and we know that we as a post-resurrection people know that every Sunday, every day is Easter, because we know, O oh God, the story of your empty tomb and the promise that you have given to us of new life in new possibilities. And yet, oh God, there are so many Good Fridays yet in our world and in our lives. And we pray through those Good Fridays for persons who have lost loved ones, for people who are experiencing those deep, deep um, chasms of grief, for those persons who are experiencing war, and just the, the trauma in the fear, um, it's just unimaginable, oh God. And yet we know, oh God, that after Good Friday, that there is Easter. And we know that the Easter story reminds us that Jesus will not be back to life like he was before Good Friday. But yet, we have not been abandoned. That Jesus comes to us in these moments with the hope and expectation that there is continued life beyond Good Friday. God, we give you thanks for your love. We give you thanks for your grace. We give you thanks that you have called us yours that you have called us by name, that you never let us walk alone, that you are always on this journey with us. And God, as we take a moment in our silent prayer and continue just to pour our hearts out to you, God, trust and know and believe that you are hearing our prayers and that you are answering our prayers, maybe not in ways that we want or expect but god in some ways they are better than we are even asking and in those moments in which are there are no words to our prayers we know and trust that your spirit is praying on our behalf for this god we give you thanks god as we come back together as your people we give you thanks on this day for hearing our prayers, for answering our prayers, for reminding us that you are God and we are yours. As we come back together as your people, we raise all of our voices together as one 
and pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church consultants Paul Nixon and Beth Ann Estak write in their book called Weird Church. Welcome to the 21st century. And it's got a picture of an upside down church on the cover. You can see, I read this a lot. It's got lots of doggy eared pages. And if I flip through, you'd see all of my miscellaneous marks and notes in the margins. And it's truly been one of my favorite books that I have read in the last many years. But they write in here, um, have you ever been in an elevator and stop to imagine what would happen if the power went out and you were stuck with a group of strangers for hours on end. You would likely end up sitting on the floor in the dark as each person tells his or her respective story. Such stranded elevator moments would help some of us who lead churches to get in touch with the broader sea of fear, the fear of death, the fear of job loss, the fear of harm to our children, the fear of a world that does not understand us or appreciate us, let alone love us, the fear that somehow we are not worthy of love or blessing. Yet a climate scientist in the stranded elevator in almost every fear we could attribute about the church health will pale before the hard realities of what is about to happen to life on this planet if water temperatures continue to rise unabated. We know that fear can be paralyzing. And it's also with, when we are in that sense of deep fear, all we want is to feel safe. Those early disciples on that day, on that first Easter day, are in a locked room because they are afraid. I would say terrified and traumatized as well. They've just experienced the horror of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. It seemed like one minute before they were having Jesus or Jesus was washing their feet and they were having the last meal with Jesus. And he was teaching them kind of those final instructions um, for life as they were going to be living it without him on earth. They'd been in ministry with Jesus for that period of time and they saw him to heal. They saw him feed people. They saw him do miracles. And it just seemed like a blink of an eye. And here they were now in this upper room. And this next minute, he had been dying on a cross. And then the next minute, Mary Magdalene had come and told them the tomb was empty. And such trauma. And they are so terrified of the Jewish authorities. And in Nixon and Estak's words, the Roman Empire, in collusion with the local religious establishment, had crushed them. They had killed Jesus. Certainly reason to be afraid. What was going to happen to them next? I imagine that kind of terror and fear is maybe somewhat what the Ukrainians are experiencing in these days. The total fear and terror and trauma of the moment, not knowing from one minute to the next whether they will live or whether they will die. This moment where the disciples are gathered in a locked room was kind of like one of those stuck in the elevator moments. You don't know what's going to happen. But in the midst of this space in this locked room, Jesus comes, and we don't know how Jesus gets into the locked room. It doesn't tell us, and that's really not as important. But I've just... This whole week, I just keep noticing new things in this whole passage that, you know, kind of keep jumping out at me. Jesus comes and stands among them and says, peace be with you. And when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. 
And I imagine what must that have been like? Jesus is here and they see him. They see the holes in his hands. They can put their hand in his side. They know Jesus. They know Jesus. And they know it's him. And they are filled with joy. Imagine what that's like when you see someone that you haven't seen in a really long time and you are just so excited to see them. And Jesus says to them, because this is not a social visit, Jesus says to them, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And as you know, I, so God continues to speak to me even when I'm standing up in front of you on Sunday mornings. And that word, receive the Holy Spirit, just kind of got my attention. It's something that we can say no to, but it's receive. It's a choice for us to receive or to not receive. It's this gift that Jesus is giving to the disciples in that moment and inviting them to receive the Holy Spirit. And I think about this, I think, oh my gosh, this is like Easter and Pentecost all in one day, all in one day. And it's so exciting because we're so used to Luke's version of Pentecost that comes up in Acts. And it comes up 50 days after the Easter comes up, the, the resurrection and the story on Easter. So 50 days from now, the first Sunday in June, we will be experiencing Pentecost in the book of Acts. But here in John's gospel, the disciples received the Holy Spirit on Easter. And I really love that, that it, we don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit, that we get the Holy Spirit right now. The Lord is breathing the Holy Spirit on them. So we know it's as much of a Pentecost story as it is an Easter story. This Pentecost story and Easter story is that moment when this new life begins, when those seeds are planted and that God is doing something in our lives. And I love Stacy's the, the plant, the, the, the dirt with the seeds, because it's so true that God plants seeds in us, the seeds that grow in the power of the Holy Spirit to, as she called us all, flowers, and to be witnesses of Jesus Christ to all the world. We know that we can't always see it, but we know that it's happening. We trust that it's happening. We believe that it's happening and know Sometimes it's very mysterious in how it happens, but we know that it's happening and we know that things are shifting and we know that there is that possibility for new life, that there is this possibility of new beginnings, for possibility of having a new way of being in the world. In our Easter Pentecost story this morning, the disciples believed because they've seen the Lord. They've seen him standing there in front of him, them. They've seen the, the holes in his hands where the nails were. They've seen the hole in his side where the sword was. And we hear the story about Thomas, and we always call him Doubting Thomas because he wanted to see to believe. And how are we to believe when we don't see Jesus standing right in front of us? You know, are we like Thomas? We want to see to believe. Or can we believe without seeing? They knew that day that what Jesus had promised is true. They remembered those words of Jesus and they knew that what Jesus promised is true. That in a little while, you will no longer see me, but I will send you the Holy Spirit so that you will remember everything that I have taught you. 
You see, Jesus didn't breathe the Holy Spirit on them to make them feel better because they were truly in the midst of crisis. And we want, in our midst of crisis, we want to feel better. When we are terrified, we want to feel safe. We want to be okay again. And when Jesus is in front of those disciples and says, peace be with you, he is telling them that they are okay, that this is a new day, that it's not going to be the same as it was four days ago, but it's going to be different, and it's going to be okay, and it's going to be good. You see, in John's gospel, the God the Father sent Jesus to make God known to the world. The disciples in the room that day know Jesus now as the Son of God. And in breathing the Holy Spirit on them, Jesus is sending them to make God known in the world. You see, each of the four Gospels has a little different purpose. They see Jesus a little differently. They all see him as the Son of God, but they have a little different mission. And in John's Gospel, Jesus' mission is to make God known to the disciples and then commissions the disciples to make God known in the world. How do we know God? How do you know God? I always stop and think when I think about knowing God. And that first Sunday that I was in um, church one Sunday, and I kept feeling through the week, you know, Jesus is saying, you know, come follow me. And I'm like, how can I follow you? I don't even really know you. I knew all the stories. Like Harry, I've been singing holy, holy, holy my entire life. And we knew holy as in holy, holy, holy versus like, I have a hole in my sock. Those are like two different, completely different things. But when you learn the word holy as in God is holy before you learn about holy as in holes in your socks, it means you're like a lot of time in church. <laughs> so, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. Biblical scholar Gail R. O'Day reminds us that Jesus is breathing new life into the disciples through the gift of the Holy Spirit and commissions them to continue his work, his work of making God known in the world. How is God made known to you? How is God made known to you? Who made God known to you? And who are you making God known? Who are you teaching about Jesus? Who are you sharing your stories about Jesus and your experiences with Jesus to others so that they too can believe even when they cannot see Jesus standing in front of them? And I think this is where these authors of this book, Weird Church, are going. Because we know that the church is not what it was 50 years ago. We know that the church isn't what it was 20 years ago. But the Holy Spirit has been given to us as the Holy Spirit was given to those first disciples. And this Holy Spirit is still active in our lives. Can you imagine sitting here this morning and just receiving the Holy Spirit. How would that change your worldview? How would that change who you are as a disciple of Jesus Christ? How would that change how you live each and every moment of each and every day? And even though we haven't seen the Lord physically, we believe because others have witnessed to us. We are living in a Pentecost moment. And I was sharing this and thinking about this a few weeks ago because I think sometimes we have a crucifixion and Good Friday perspective on our Christian faith. And so much of our Christian faith is the death of Jesus on the cross. And then there's another perspective about the Easter morning and the tomb being empty. And it's about the resurrection of Jesus. And because we believe in the resurrection, we know that there is hope and possibility for a new life. But seldom do we talk about 
Pentecost, in the coming of the Holy Spirit, even though we know that the Spirit is here and all around and, and breathing new life into us each and every day. Where these authors in this weird church are going is we are a Pentecost people. We are a Spirit-filled people. We have received already the Holy Spirit. And Jesus breathed this Holy Spirit into us already. We've received this Holy Spirit. What difference does it make in our lives? This life of new possibilities, that we are empowered to be a witness to others, to reveal God to others so that God, so that others know God in a way that we know God. And I've always said, if you kind of sum up John's gospel, it's, it's knowing God. It's when you know Jesus, you know God. When you know what Jesus is doing, you know what God is doing. When you know who Jesus is, you know who God is. The next verse after Jesus commissions the disciples is a little troubling for us in the 21st century. It says, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. And if you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. And I always kind of look at that and I'm like, huh? But then I remind, re, I'm reminded that um, the scholar Gail R. O'Day reminds us that in John's gospel, sins have a theological failing. It's not the moral or behavioral transgression that we are so familiar with. To have sin is to be blind to the revelation of God in Jesus. I say that again. To have sin is to be blind to the revelation of God in Jesus. It's like saying that is not God when you're looking at Jesus and knowing Jesus. It's not God. But that's what sin is. And so how we come to believe and we are challenged in our unbelief as Thomas was challenged in his unbelief. And even when he saw Jesus standing right in front of him, he wanted to put his hands in Jesus' side, he wanted to see the nail marks in his hands, and Jesus invited him to. That was one of the other things I caught this week that I hadn't really caught much before. It said, how did Jesus know that that was Thomas's doubt? You know, that Jesus, that Thomas didn't want to believe or couldn't believe unless he saw Jesus. You know, if Jesus is in their room one day, and Jesus is not there till the next week when Thomas is there. And I thought, hmm, knows all, knows all, knows where we have our doubts, knows where we are skeptical. And I find it interesting in this story about Thomas is that Jesus helps him to believe and comes to him in his disbelief to help him to believe. And the message for me in that moment is that even if we are skeptical that Jesus is the son of God, even in our own doubting in not wanting to believe unless we see ourselves, Jesus is there in God's grace, helping us to see so we can believe. Even that we don't do alone. When we live in a as a Pentecost people, we are open to the Holy Spirit at work through us to make God known to the world. When we let go of that fear that keeps us in a locked room, we can be open to new possibilities. We can trust God. We can hope and have hope in a future because we know that the kingdom of God is a world of grace and kindness. As we listen and we watch and see where God is at work in our lives today and in our world today, and to see and accept that invitation to join God, true, our 21st century church looks very different than it did in the early church. And one of the things I love about this book is that it talks about the different changes and the different shifts that we have gone through in our lifetime as a church. And they've got several models in this book as well um, for churches in the 21st century. 
as we're moving out of the church the way that it used to be and into this new model as a Pentecost people. And I particularly love the model, um, the dinner party church. And I just want to read for you um, what they write about this dinner party. Wouldn't a dinner party church be awesome? So they write about the dinner party church. Tiffany Keith was inspired by the Moth Radio Hour, which I listen to every Saturday night, when she began Stories at the Edge. So she discovered the power in listening to and sharing stories. And she combined a dinner party atmosphere with three storytellers at each meal. As we know, story helps guides help people to process and practice their story so they can feel comfortable sharing it during dinner. And the guides actually become mentors in the process. And they continue to write. After the stories are told, the dinner guests are asked questions in Alexio Divina kind of fashion. It's a meditating on the word and discerning and listening to where God is in this story. And that's what Lexio Divina is. And so they can reflect on how the story connects to their own lives. In this process of deep and prayer-filled listening, they find themselves on holy ground, inspired, connected, transformed. The brilliance of this church model, they write, is that everyone needs to eat, and most people enjoy dinner conversations. The importance is in the intentionality of the gathering the rituals and the conversations. As often as we do this, we can remember Jesus' invitation to embrace the sacredness of life in our common humanity. It's that power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives and in our church today that continues to reveal Jesus Christ as the Son of God to us each and every day in new ways. Sometimes when we get so caught up in our fear and can't see beyond, I invite you just to open, open up, receive the Holy Spirit and trust and have hope that, the, that God is as, li as alive today as God was to those first disciples. And know that this is a new day that this is a day filled with new possibilities and new opportunities because we're not in this by ourselves, that God is in the world because God wants the world to know God. God wants the world to believe in God because it's not about us. It's not about Thomas. It's about who God is in our relationship with God. And in John's gospel, we are being invited into this relationship. Imagine Jesus breathing on you and inviting you receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father sends me and you, go out into the world in the peace of God. Amen.
Our benediction this morning is a responsive benediction. Believe where you have not seen. Our hearts will lead the way. Trust where you have reason to doubt. Our souls will lead us home. Hope where you have cause to despair. Our lives will know joy and peace. Go with God's blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you stand, please? as we sing together the benediction. And you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy, and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands oh you go out with joy you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace the mountains and the hills will break forth before you there'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap will clap their hands and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Oh, you go out.